it was tough to build that culture. But I can tell you one thing, if you're authentic and if you're honest and you're doing it for the right reason, you're coming in from the right place, people just connect. And that was something which I would say I was. Welcome back to another episode of the Beyond the Scale podcast. I'm your host, Mary Catherine. And today I have a special guest. I have a Fit Body Bootcamp owner. I have Vic Desai, right? That's right. <laughs> you can just call me Vic. <laughs> I have a Fit Body Bootcamp owner here with me, Vic. Vic is, his professional journey began with a master's degree in electrical engineering before getting into Fit Body Bootcamp. He was following the conventional career path for many Indians who moved to the U.S. during the dot-com of the early 2000s. Vic initially did not prioritize his fitness. However, in 2004, he embraced fitness for aesthetic reasons. Then in 2010, Vic's passion for fitness evolved into a side endeavor as he earned his NASM CPT certification. By 2020, he decided to transform his passion into a purpose, aiming to make a significant impact on his community. He started first with online coaching and then opened Westboro Fit Body Bootcamp, striving to empower individuals to lead healthier lives through fitness. Today, Vic and his team have positively impacted 600 plus lives, organized multiple fundraising events, raising a total of $5,000 and helping numerous members reduce their medication dependence and build confidence. They're excited to launch Fit Body Forever, a program tailored for the 55 and up community here coming up in Q4. And their mission is to expand their community impact by making fitness enjoyable and achievable within busy lifestyles. So welcome Vic to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for you to be here. So I want to first start with how you kind of broke that traditional mold, that traditional path, and you stepped away from engineering, which was something you had a degree in, so you worked hard in it, Yeah. but then you decided, hey, this isn't for me. I want to go into fitness. Yep. Talk to us a little bit about that. So uh, I, I, I come from an Indian family and uh you know, the, uh, my parents were born in India. They were raised in India. And one thing that my dad had decided that he was not going to pursue his career in India. He was going to move outside India because at that time, India was not what you know about India right now. So I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, went to school over there. And, uh, you know, everything was, it was a luxurious life over there. It was a pretty soft world, soft world over there. So I grew up in a very well cared for setting. My parents called me the prince. Um, <laughs> everything was served to me on a silver platter. I was not a spoiled kid, but everything was served to me on a silver platter. And uh, you know, the same thing happened when I moved into engineering because it was kind of, um, everyone was doing it. So it was an it was easy natural. thing. Yeah, it was yeah. just a natural extension of, uh, you know, everyone's doing it. I might as well do it yeah. kind of stuff. So I decided to pursue my engineering. Uh, and again, this is as a teenager. Uh, from Lagos, I moved to Bombay, Mumbai, as it's known now in India. Did my engineering degree over there in part of the high school. And uh, in 1990, late, late 1990s into early 2000, there was a big slow of um, Indians moving out of India or South Asians, everyone moving out of India, their native countries and coming to U.S. because there was a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. Again, followed everyone and came in over here and uh, pursued my master's degree because it was just the next uh, right thing to do uh, versus just diving directly into the job world. So decided to do my master's degree in electrical engineering in uh, Stony Brook. And even that was very simple. Even though it seems to me like master's, yeah. I took the easy, pa easy path over there, uh, got by with the easy courses. Got straight A's over there. I did work hard a little bit, I would say, but got straight A's. And uh, my sister lived in Long Island, so it was one of the best, smoothest arrivals that you can have in the country. You know, when you're moving countries, you were like anxious. And I was like, I walked out literally like a prince. I'm like, I'm going to my sister's place. Everything is all set for me versus all my friends who moved. They had the figure it out mentality. So yeah. I had never had the figure it out mentality so far in my life till 2002, yeah. 2003. And the bubble bursted at that time and there were no jobs. So I was literally out of a job, 5,000 in my bank account. And again, my sister came into my rescue and like, move in with us, you will save on rent. Yeah. Again, took the easy, I mean, it was a smart thing to right. do, but I took the easy path out. And uh, I felt very sorry for the situation because I blamed the economy for not getting a job, not 
me not working hard enough for getting the job, not getting a job, and uh, I was waiting for a white knight to come and rescue me again. My <laughs> sister came and said, oh, I know someone, they are looking for an IT professional, you guys talk and see how it goes. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So, uh, you know, now we're at 23, 24, you're earning 50,000, you have a car, you're not paying rent. Uh, you're getting, life is good. Life is good. You know, who, who wants to rock that, rock right. that boat, rock that ship, right? So, and then, uh, so I, I was just, you know, working long, like doing everything, yeah. like how everyone else does and waking up, going to work, coming back, partying and doing all that stuff, uh, you know, heavy partying on the weekends and everything. And then, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years, got married. And uh, I think that was my first evolution because after I got married, my wife, she's a, she completed her PhD in biomedical engineering, which is pretty high up wow, there. Wow, yeah. So she decided to move to Chicago to pursue her career. And uh, that was my first evolution, I would say. I'm like, wow, she's career-oriented. She's moving states. She, mm -hmm. And we are married. She's okay with a long-distance relationship just to go get it. And I'm here playing poker and having beer and doing all that just stuff. Just living the comfortable life. Just living life. the comfortable life. So I had an awakening call at that time, I would say. And I'm like, I'm, she's not here anyway, so let me pursue an MBA degree. Somewhere all along this journey, fitness became a part of my life in 2004 because we were getting married. And it continued to be for aesthetic reasons all the way. Mm -hmm. But it, it was still there. I was consistent with fitness mm -hmm. and I was still doing it, uh, just not taking a deep dive into it, not knowing the science behind it. And uh, in 2006 or seven, uh, 2008 is when I decided to do my MBA because of that awakening call. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to do MBA in entrepreneurship, small business management and entrepreneurship. And I wanted to switch careers into finance because IT was getting too boring for me. And again, a lot of people were doing that. Yeah. And I was seeing success over there. I, I was seeing my friends do it and they were seeing success. I'm like, all right, let me make a shift. I made that shift and then again, the industry tanked over there in finance in 2010, uh, 11, the entire real estate bubble bursted. Yeah. So I got laid off and everyone was pretty much out of a job. There were Harvard MBAs that could be hired off the street. They would not, who were experienced. I was not even experienced in the finance world. So I decided to twist the entrepreneurial muscle at that time. And uh, I got my NASM CPT because I had a passion for fitness and made it a side gig. And I also started a small business consulting, mm -hmm. which tanked terribly. Zero clients. <laughs> uh, so uh, fitness was picking up a little bit. I was doing boot camps in the park and uh, I was having few one-on-one -on -one clients. It was just getting me beer money pretty yeah. much, I would say. You know, barely when you could get groceries, mm -hmm. forget paying mortgage or anything. So I was definitely trying to go back to the job market because, you know, you have a mortgage, you have a baby on the way, a first kid on the way. So that was not enough. And... Uh, I, I've mentioned this before. After substance abuse, the second most addictive thing is a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So I got addicted to the paycheck again. And the even though I'd flexed the entrepreneurial muscle at that time, not to the level that I should have. Mm -hmm. And fitness was just a side gig, side gig, side gig. And uh, in 2017, I injured my knee and I had a surgery. That is when I had my awakening call. And I'm like, I got to do something with my life. This yeah. is just getting too monotonous. Right. Same I got to do something. It, it was like a cassette playing in yeah. the, you know, the same recording, recording playing again and again. And I had to make a change. So in 2017 is where I decided to start looking into businesses. And uh, two failed attempts to start a business. Both of them I missed by a day on securing a territory. I wanted to do a franchise always because I believed in the turnkey model. Mm -hmm. So I did that and uh, I was researching things. One of them was F45 and uh, I lost the territory. And uh, one of them was a coding school for kids. I lost the territory. Uh, so as you see, there was you know a wide range of things that I was looking at. Yeah. All this while again, having fitness on the side. And then in about 2018, 2019, I got a little bit more serious, started looking at businesses around and uh, like we were discussing right before the podcast, it was a donut shop <laughs> and or it was something in fitness. And then now uh, because you were researching in fitness all the time, you know, now the ads and everything come in. Right. And guess who pops up? Bedros is right there in front of me on the screen. And I just felt like he was talking to me. I, I, for some reason, I, I felt very connected yeah. to the way he was promoting Fit Body Bootcamp and the why behind that. And it felt literally like he was talking to me that, Vic, this is for you. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to take it to the next level. I'm like, I need to make, I need to open up something. I need to take this one-on-one -on -one coaching to a group level coaching. 
and that is what I wanted to do. So that's the entire journey from an engineer to an MBA to a yeah. Fit Body Bootcamp owner. I love it. So I want to un unpack a few things. So you mentioned your wife and how she earned her PhD and she went on to practice and do such amazing things. And you were kind of like, okay, if she's going to do that, what am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. I know there's a lot of people listening to this and, and I have friends that have been in this situation where it's like, you can easily sit back and you can let your significant other take the lead and do their thing. And you can just kind of fall in the shadows. But you were like, hey, I don't want to fall in the shadows. I want to do something great too. Yeah. Was there ever like um, a little bit of healthy competition between the two of you when you started getting into your business um, endeavors? Or was it like she was always really supportive of you making this change? To just, you know, for anyone yeah. listening who might be in a situation like that. I, I don't think so. There was any healthy competition as such. I don't think so. We were competitive. I would say there were conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, conflicts on decisions that we were making. Yeah. And evaluating, you know, the the right path forward. Right. Uh, she's very analytical about things. And I am very impulsive. Mm -hmm. I, I take fast decisions. Yeah. I make fast decisions. So she sometimes helps helps to ground me. So... That is where conflict happens, right? Yeah. I want to move fast. And she's like, well, have you thought Slow about down. this, right? Yeah. So I think that is what was happening. And it was just always support for each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know if a lot of people that would say in a heartbeat, yeah, fine, go ahead and do things in Chicago. Yeah. And she actually just trusted me over there because she didn't even ask my permission. She's like, I'm going. And we are married at that point. Yeah. So, you know, you're rocking the entire base at that time because we have an apartment and I'm commuting to the city. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to, I'm packing my bags and I'm yeah. going to Chicago. And I'm like, all right, that means I cannot live where I'm living right now. I got to live closer to work. What am I going to do doing this one hour commute every right. day? So a lot of things were shaking at the foundation, uh, were shaken up at the foundational level, but we both just trusted each other and supported. So I wouldn't say competitive. Yeah. Uh, I would say collaborative, but healthy, healthy conflict, mm -hmm. which is getting the best out of us. So that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So you open your location. Talk to us about those first few months, because, you know, this was something that it didn't just happen overnight. Like you had gotten into fitness, you were seeing, you were developing that passion. You started training clients, but then when you open up your own boot camp, that's a whole nother level of training and you're able to impact more lives than you were doing one-on-one -on -one training. So talk to us about like how rewarding that was and what were the challenges? I think uh, when you open up a brick and mortar location, the first thing that comes to your mind is, will you be able to afford to pay the rent? I think that crosses everyone's mind who's moving from an online model to an, you know, physical location. Right. I think that was the biggest challenge. That was the hardest pill for me to swallow. I'm like, I think we'll be able to do this. We'll be able to pull it off. Uh, the business model is right. It, it's worked for so many lo successful locations. Mm -hmm. And that is what convinced me in 2019 to go ahead with it. I knew there were going to be challenges because I'm still doing my full 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 time job. Yeah. So I'm moonlighting that along with doing, you know, a fitness business. And yeah. I knew I was going to get into it with a lot of work that had to come from my side pretty much live out of the gym, just come back home for meals and shower and go back. Mm -hmm. So I knew those challenges were going to happen. They were going to come my way. And I was ready for that. What we were not ready for is what everyone was not ready for is COVID. Right. And that was a big wrench that came to, ev ev I think, everyone, each and every person. And uh, for me, I think it worked both ways. One is it challenged me. And at the same time, it was favorable because a lot of people wanted to get out and work out. So COVID definitely threw a big wrench. Forget a wrench. It probably threw a big toolkit in my way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, here, here's the hammer. Here's the wrench. Here, right. do it. Do whatever. Yeah. And uh, I decided to take advantage of that. I still had days uh, during that time because I signed in 2019 November mm -hmm. and March, everything shut down. And I was scheduled to open in June without a location. Yeah. As per the agreement, I had to open a location by June. Everything was slow. No landlord was responding. And I was probably one of the rare ones who was frantically knocking on the landlord's door. I'm like, guys, respond to yeah. my... It's like uh, everyone else is closing their business. Yeah. And you're knocking saying, I want to open. I want to open, right? Because I have June that I have to open with and right. I need money coming in. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm not going to just land up paying fees and not making any money. Right. And so a lot of challenges and anxiety at that time. And again, everyone was moving to the work from home model. Mm -hmm. Kids were home. So 
it, it, there were too many variables at that time. And uh, my lawyer said, you know what? Just eat up the fees for three months. Don't open a location. You, it's going to be a disaster for you. So I took his advice. Actually, I didn't knock on the landlord's doors anymore. And I yeah. took a break for about a couple of weeks. I was not looking for locations. And then luckily, the current location that we were just showed up on LoopNet. And uh, it was probably just meant to be. Yeah. It was prime location, right on the main road, big place, affordable rent. And I'm like, I got to move on this. Yeah. And it's like eight minutes away from my house. I'm like, I got to move on this. So yeah. that's when... So that was, again, favorable to me, right? COVID kind of, he also wanted to get some business mm-hmm. because he does not want an empty location. And I wanted to move in. So yeah, it was so a good fit. Out. Yeah. So with the challenges that COVID threw, there were also benefits that happened. And I started looking at the positives. I had days where I'm like, I'm not going to do it body anymore. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm gonna, sure. I'm not going to open it because you're March, April, May, and you don't know what to do at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't even have, I'd I'd secured the location by May. So that phase of March to May was very, you know, stressful, anxiety. And again, keep in mind, I've not gone through hardships as yet. You know, like I've, everything has just worked out for me versus me figuring it out. So any small hurdle and I was like getting all worked up. Well, every, the times were so unknown too. And it was like. It was challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And. Again, the healthy conflict with my wife. She said that, you know, what do we think? Do you think you're, you're making the right decision? We don't want to th- throw good money behind the money that you have already invested. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to HQ and everything? And, and I did want to do it, but I decided not to because somewhere I felt that fit body is the right thing. Yeah. I, I had to convince my wife, and I'm like, if I can convince her, I can convince a lot of people, right? So it's someone who knows everything and she knows that, you know, no, he believes in this model. He's, you know, she trusts me. So uh, if I could convince her, I knew that I could convince everyone else because she's a tough one to convince at times. Yeah. Um, So we continued and then I pivoted to an online coaching model. Again, the advantages of COVID at that time. And I I know a lot of people who wanted to work out. And they, I'm like, let me just start an online mm-hmm. coaching and get used to coaching and everything. So I did an online coaching model under the FitBody brand, and that worked really well. I had like 45, 50 people and friends and family. And uh, that kind of set the path forward for me to open a location. Yeah. So I felt that even though there were ch- challenges with COVID, but we made it work for us. Right. Um, and there was challenge in opening a location because yeah. it was a very soft opening, you know, Nowadays, when we hear locations opening, they're like 100 plus. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. we had the grand opening and the entire thing, but we had a soft opening. I would say 70 people came Mm -hmm. in and uh, they were just trying us out and about 50 or 60 stayed on versus the 100 that now people open with, Mm -hmm. you know, 100 plus members. So we had a very soft opening. I was in a regulated state, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So masks, six feet distancing. And it gets tougher to convince. The sales process was tougher because it's hard to get people to exercise. Right. And even though they want to, maybe, nobody wants to do it for the long term. So they'll come in for the short term. And now you throw in the entire mask mm-hmm. on that, on top of that. So it's like, I'm good in my house because I would rather do online videos without the mask versus go to a place with the mask. So yeah. there were many challenges with that. But at the same time, there was a crowd who wanted to work out. And... Uh, I mean, you guys had lo- running locations at that yeah. time, and you being an owner, I'm pretty sure you've experienced those challenges yourself. So, oh yeah, yeah. And the six feet, we had the same thing. And some of our clients, they would come in and they would say, "Well, I don't want to work out standing in place. I want to move around to the station." Right, right. And we're like, "We hear you. We want to do that too." And we did have clients that would say, "I'd rather work out at home and move all around than have to stand here in place." And and I yeah. understood. Yeah. I understood, but yeah, challenging times. But I know that on the other side of that, we learned so much. And I think you hear it said a million different ways, but, you know, it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time during COVID. What lessons would you say that you learned during that time about the importance of mental fortitude and having the mental and emotional strength to just keep going? Oh, my God. (laughs) That was, uh, I, I believe that, you know, mental strength, just like physical strength and the fortitude is not built overnight, mm-hmm. right? It's it's very similar to glutes, quads, chest, biceps, that you have to flex that muscle yeah. for it to get stronger. You have to start, though. 
it's not just going to happen mm-hmm. so i think many things helped during that time from uh building that mental strength but it was very tough at the beginning because like i said i was i was, I was getting worked up with every small thing mm-hmm. you know every any small problem i was just magnifying yeah. it i was making it of such a big magnitude and like it doesn't have to be this much i, I don't have to take it so seriously it will work out i'll figure it out and all those things it happened as things evolved yeah. as you opened the location and again there were different challenges that everyone face faces when they open a location i faced many different challenges as well some challenges are unique in nature and some are common um but the good part what i felt is the community of the fit body the fit body community mm-hmm. oh man i think that was uh, that was a savior so i really leaned upon that a lot for when i was opening the location and i was going through the challenges and that made me believe that i'm not the unique one who's having a problem right. there are others and they have solved it so next time a similar problem came in my reaction was different i'm like it's solvable mm-hmm. i just need to go to the right people for that or i need to get the right toolkit for that yeah. it is solvable so i think as that muscle got flexed is when it got stronger and stronger not to say that i can face anything right now there are days where you want to hide under a rock oh, sure but that muscle needs to be flexed and uh, you know you you have to just experience it so i felt that the fit body community helped a lot you know support at home helps a lot opening up with a partner who understands helps a lot and and uh, following the right people mm-hmm. i did take some you know i did follow the right people before it's funny my social media was all celebrities <laughs> <laughs> and i moved from that completely and now it's all motivational speakers and you know people who own gyms and run gyms and and teach you how to run gyms so i started not that i unfollowed them but you know that's how the algorithm works the moment right. you start following people whom you you are yeah. content yeah and that is what i started doing and uh, i opened up a lot honestly in that time mm-hmm. 2020 2021 2022 i opened up a lot stepped out of my comfort zone I think I think it's many times said and that don't suffer in silence mm-hmm. um and I always tried to swim to the helicopter. Yeah. I didn't do a lot of cap calls but CJ, Tom, Mike. Yeah. I reached out a lot to them um uh, at that time Bryce just was going to be the CEO so he was his communication channel he he still open to a lot of questions. Yeah. But at that time he was not in the CEO role so he was responding to a lot of Bryce did a lot of my onboarding actually. Mm-hmm. So a lot of questions in the fit body community and people who were around Herve was there so I used to sometimes tap on his door and ask him how did he handle certain yeah. things um with so uh opening up a lot was you know was a big thing for me because I only opened up to people that I worked with not people that I didn't know mm-hmm. and fit body it was a brand new world for me it's like literally stepping out into a on a different planet and interacting with aliens i felt that yeah. way because everyone was speaking a language i don't even know what eft was at that time right right and it's talking about how important it is yeah. i have to know what it is and, and and people throw these acronyms ltv for a client yeah. you know all of that and i'm like what is all this and i had to be so vulnerable at that mm-hmm. point but coachable so it was a it was a very tough transition but something that i'm glad I made. Yeah. So I do think that that strength mental strength came from being vulnerable, being coachable and leaning upon the community a lot. Mm-hmm. So and I think it's interesting that you mentioned how like every little thing you thought was so important and I remember feeling like that too when we opened our location. It's like you have these little problems and you feel like it's the end of the world when to your point there's other owners that have all had those same problems and they dealt with it. and they have the solution they have the answer that you're looking for all you have to do is ask exactly. all you have to do is ask for help exactly. and sometimes i think that even you i mean you in covid during covid opening up a business during that has its own complexities to it but a lot of times as entrepreneurs <clears throat> excuse me and business owners we feel like we're supposed to be the leaders we're supposed to be the one to figure it out we've just got to do this on our own that's right you joined a fitness franchise for that reason and you joined something that had a proven success model so that you didn't have to do that. Yeah. So, it's so great now that, you know, you've been an owner for all five almost 5 years. 3 and a half years. Okay. Closing on 4 years. And 
I'm sure you see new owners all the time say things yes. like, oh, I remember when I dealt with that. Absolutely. And I thought it was the end of the world, but it turns out it wasn't. Absolutely, absolutely. I think what, what you mentioned right now is so important. When you open up a business, for some reason you step into this stage of life where you feel you have to know it all. Right. You have to know it all because your family members are thinking, hey, what, mm -hmm. what was he thinking when he was opening you this business prove, if he doesn't know it, right? Prove yeah. Himself. Your team, your coaches, your members, mm -hmm. everyone thinks that this guy knows it all. But in reality, that probably is one, one face of you. There are many things that you don't know. And you should be open to that, saying, I don't know this. I need to learn this. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be egoistic and say, no, I know this. And, and if you know it wrong, you're in deep trouble. Right. Uh, so you have to know it right. You have to know your weaknesses. And I think that was something that was a big learning, learning curve for me mm -hmm. that I'm not supposed to know it all. Yeah. I, I don't know it all. I need to ask the right people so that I can do the right things. Otherwise, I'm going to land flat on my face and I'll have to shut down. Yeah. So that that was a big, big transition for me. Uh, Definitely. What's the one thing that like still gets you out of bed in the morning? Because I know as a business owner doing this for over seven years now, I mean, there's days where you're like, oh, do I really want to go into the gym? Do I really want to do this? And you got to give yourself that little pep talk. So what do you what do you say to yourself in that pep talk? What's your reason? My main reason, I think uh, I have to say this is the the people who come to the gym, they are how do I say this? It's it's the fit fam, I would say, you know, because we have such a great relationship that I know that if I show up below my, I would say, energy, at, at, at a low energy, at a low vibration, it's going to impact close to 100 people that day. And that is going to have a bigger impact because if I could influence 100 mm -hmm. and each of them, let's say, influence 10 on a daily life, uh, on, on a daily basis... That's just going to multiply. It all trickles down. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and I would say I will single-handedly take the blame for that. So there are days when you don't want to wake up, mm -hmm. right? And you want to cuddle in cold winter days, yeah. right? And, uh, but, and, and, and you do wake up and you have to give yourself that pep talk that, you know, don't do it for yourself today. Do it for the hundred people that are coming in, mm. because just imagine the impact that they're gonna have. Yeah, and just just the, just that fact that these guys are also going through the same thing. They're waking up in the morning, maybe at different hours. They're waking up in the morning. They don't want to work out. This is your business, yeah. but they don't want to work out. But they're still gonna show up. That speaks volumes about them, about their commitment, their dedication to their life, and you are probably responsible, partially responsible for that. So own that responsibility and take it forward. So I think that is what always does get me into the right zone. There are people relying on you. There are people who are looking up to you. And you will probably define their day if you do it right. Right. You got to step in with the right energy, the right vibration. Yeah, do it for them and not for yourself. I love so that. That is, that is what keeps pushing me. Yeah. Every single day. That's awesome. Yeah. So you mentioned before we started recording this or when we were just chatting back and forth on emails that, you know, being an immigrant does not put you as a, at a disadvantage yeah. when it comes to owning a business. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think being an immigrant, a lot of times people uh, enter that shell that they are here to work for someone else because they are they feel indebted to the country, right? So let's say if you move countries, now right. you feel indebted to the country. This country accepted me with open arms. I want to give my service to this country. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people, I feel, feel that that service could come in terms of, you know, being a good citizen, which everyone should be, mm -hmm. you know, paying the taxes and doing, the, you know, doing your job. I, yeah. I would urge people to take that to a different level that create an impact in the community. And that will be the best way to give back to the country. Yeah. That is the best way to give back to a country that welcomed you as an immigrant. And how are you going to create an impact? And there is direct and indirect impact, mm -hmm. right? Majority of the people who are going into work, they might be creating an impact in the community. I always felt you need to create a direct impact. I can point a finger and I can say, I changed this person's life because of Fit Body Bootcamp. That is what I would say is, sh should be, I would say that, and that is what lets me sleep in the night. Yeah. I would, lets me sleep properly. So that is the mindset that I would ask everyone to embrace. Initially, there are tough 
tough challenges for sure. Not everyone can just start, come into the country and start something. Yeah. Uh, but don't be of the mindset that you got to be, you know, the average person. You can definitely do a lot more. And the moment you put your mind at the right place, then you want to make an impact in the community in whatever, a for-profit organization, yeah. not-for-profit organization. I think that is that will drive you forward. And I, I highly encourage everyone to do that. Yeah. I mean, really. That's great. Can you talk to us a little bit about, I know, culture and community. We put that at the forefront of our business. All of us business owners and leaders within the Fitbody brand, we talk about how we're in the people business. You did start your business during COVID. So building culture and community was very different for you than it was for me because I was able to have my doors open, operate as normal, whereas you had all of these restrictions. Was it difficult to blend your community with the people that were training online to then the people were training in person and when you brought them all together and things started to you know normalize post-covid yeah was that difficult it, it had its own challenges mm -hmm. um so the ones who were online about i would say 10 percent came in the location the ones who were online were mainly remote from different states okay uh, they were friends and family mm -hmm. um so but 10 percent came i would say into the gym and they were very understanding of the new re requirements of yeah. wearing the mask. But the challenge that I had was me mm -hmm. because I was an online coach and now I am a coach in a physical location. So I had to shift the way I coach people. I had to shift the way I um, am operating a business. And that was a big challenge. And in that, definitely, you know, when people are coming in, building that culture was tough. And, and also when I was an online coach, it was a little bit easier to build a culture because people knew me even before I started Fit Body Bootcamp. Mm -hmm. But here I'm meeting people for the first time. So it was tough to build that culture. But I can tell you one thing, if you're authentic and if you're honest and you're doing it for the right reason, you're coming in from the right place, people just connect. And that was something which I would say I was. I was, I initially opened the location to make money, mm -hmm. but very quickly moved, transitioned to make an impact. Mm -hmm. And people could see that. And that is why I have, I still have people who have started with me from day one, which is, I would say, and in COVID right. days, yeah. some people who have crossed for a location that's three and a half years in, some people at 750 sessions, that's huge. That just talks about the loyalty and the yeah. culture. So it, it, it has to come from you being authentic and you being honest and exactly knowing what impact you want to create. And that just shows in your culture. And that's how you build your team. And, that, and the team needs to align with the core values. So I have certain core values as on, a, on a personal end, which of course is there on the business end. And the business has some core values. There is, a, there is a hybrid over there between the personal and the professional one, but then the professional ones are a little bit different as well. But the core values of me being who I am was there in both the worlds, person and professional. And that's why I felt building the culture was a new thing, but something that I was able to do well. So yeah, there were challenges. There were some members who didn't become a part of the culture. Right. And I tell my current members, I fired them. Yeah. I didn't want them to renew their membership or their trial. I literally fired them because they would have really brought the culture down. Mm -hmm. People who are very vocal about the mask policy, people who are vocal about... Uh, you know, uh, I do. How much do you sanitize? Now we did everything right. Yeah. Uh, but it was tough to keep everyone happy, mm -hmm. um, and we did the best we could. But I, I was being honest and authentic about things, and I'm like, listen, we have to shut the place down because there was an outbreak. Mm -hmm. I know you missed the session. There's only so much that I can do. But we had to shut the place down for everyone's benefit, for uh, for everyone's well-being. So again, there were clashes over there and I'm like, I don't want to renew the membership on that member yeah. because they are not uh, fitting my culture. Right. Uh, and the same thing with team members, you know, so it has to come from you, honestly. Uh, you have to lead the the culture <laughs> yeah. for that matter. So, And I think that speaks volumes to your leadership. Like it all does stem down from the leadership. But two, you know, for anyone listening, like, we say we're in the people business and we're all about relationships and we are, but sometimes that one person can break the culture. They can Absolutely. ruin the culture. And, you know, we do everything we can to inspire people and empower people and cultivate that warm feeling for it to be an open space and a safe space. And if you have someone that can't 
let you do that. Yeah. You're, as a leader, it's like they have to go. They, they do. And then and, and they, uh, I used to come back home and tell to my wife that this one person or these couple of people are bringing my energy down yeah. when I'm coaching. Right. And I feel, I feel like it's, it's uh, injustice to the others who are coming in to work hard. I think I didn't, didn't do my job right. And uh, again, it takes a lot of peeling the different onion layers, right? Is it me? Is it my sleep? Was it my food? Yeah. Was it the last night? Or what <laughs> triggered, right? So I right. had to really dissect that. And we we really wean out our trials also now. I started doing that in the last few weeks and last mm -hmm. few months because some of them were bringing my energy down because they were just not kind of fitting the culture. Yeah. And I'm like, I think we need to start, uh, you know, weeding the process of the right trials mm -hmm. <laughs> because we want to make sure they're a culture fit. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we don't renew some memberships. We don't pursue them. Yeah. We follow them. So this is uh, a question I have never asked before. What is a person... Just tell us someone who fits the culture. Like, oh, that's a, what yeah. Profile. I, I, yeah, I think I think uh, someone who comes in, I would say. So we have our avatar of Mrs. Mm -hmm. Jones, right. right? But I think it, you know, like in their middle middle age, like between the ages of maybe thirty to 55, 60, That's the age group. Mm -hmm. Couple of kids, one kid working, or maybe stay at home, mm -hmm. and they're walking in. They want to feel recognized. They want to feel confident. They want to feel that they are achieving something in those 30 minutes and going back stronger mm -hmm. emotionally, physically, right? There are people who don't see that value. And the ones who don't are the ones who are out. There are people who come in with an attitude of, I've been a CrossFitter, so this is going to be very easy for me. Yep. And they still sweat and they are out of breath, <laughs> right? Because yeah, we great. still, yeah. And, and, and I asked them how it was. Obviously, they're coming from, I'm not saying nothing against CrossFit again. Yeah. I'm not trying to say that. But, you know, the, they come with that attitude, the that different air mm -hmm. that I think I got this. This should be easy. And uh, some people stay through because they realize that we, we are 30 minutes, but still effective. And some people still have that air. Those guys are out. So uh, the culture fit is they got to fit the Mrs. Jones. Mm -hmm. They got to fit that anyone and everyone is accepted over here. No one is no one is supposed to say, oh, this person is is, is not the right. Right, I, right. You know? Not excluding anyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, not intimidating anyone, mm -hmm. right? Not having that superiority complex that, oh, I am fit. I mean, we have some people in the gym who are like at a pretty low body fat and they're still coming in to maintain it. Yeah. But that does not mean that you come off with a different attitude to others. They still got to fit the culture like right. you it's got to be non-intimidating it's got to be welcoming it's got to be warm you know when someone comes in mm -hmm. people no one should be standing in a corner and you know mm -hmm. just by themselves on their phone i want to make sure everyone is interacting and we, some people are introverts yeah. but for us we can we can doing this for three and a half years now my team and i can easily identify those who will not fit the culture mm -hmm. so it, it it's either it's a gut or it's just experience i don't know what it is but Doing it for three and a half years, we know this one's going to be a great culture fit and this one's not. So, mm. um, like I said, warm, Mrs. Jones, in, non-intimidating, appreciating the value that we deliver. Yeah. It's not just a workout. Yes, that's, it is a workout, but it is empowering you that you can do tough things. You can do challenging things. Yeah. You know, you can go dominate once you leave this session because we do tough things on demand. So, yeah. that's I love that answer. Yeah, be open to change, open to grow, receptive to feedback, yep. all of those. Coachable. Things. Yeah, coachable. Yeah, definitely. It's it's hard to coach someone who comes in and they say they don't need a coach. Yeah, it's so difficult. Exactly, and yeah. and, and those are the people who don't stick. Right. I would say, mm -hmm. uh, if they are coming in for a workout and they're coming into the gym, uh, coming into Fit Body. Uh, they love the workouts, but they I think those are going to be the short-term people. Mm -hmm. People who are coming in for a transformation, for right. a program, for for uh, a community, you know, setup. Right. They are the people who stick and love it. Yeah. Now, some people come in with the prior mindset and they very quickly change it because our team does a great job. Our fit family does a great job. Mm -hmm. But some people just don't. And those are the ones who leave in the trial or, yeah. you know, the first renewal of the membership. So. Well, awesome. Well, Vic, is there any parting pieces of wisdom that you'd like to leave our listeners with when it comes to business ownership, 
community, culture, anything about your journey? For business ownership, I think I would say the journey that I went through is uh, very intimidating when you look at it uh, from an outsider's mm -hmm. viewpoint. It, it It is very intimidating. And, and I was an outsider when I was looking at other people's journey. Sure. Um, and when I stepped into that journey, very lot, of, very stressful, a lot of uh, you know anxiety. But you have to be prepared to do the hard work. A lot of times, people hope that everything will just fall in place. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a very famous, I would say, I, I might butcher the quote, but it's going to take longer than you think, and it's going to cost you more than you budget for. Mm -hmm. um, and once that, you don't realize until you're doing going it you're it. going through it yeah so anyone who's trying to embark the journey you know first of all give yourself some grace for what you have where you have come so far and uh you know be open to the change be be coachable and in order to be coachable i would say you know be vulnerable and and go to a coach mm -hmm. get a coach yeah i think everyone is a coach in this fit body world for other owners we we really step in and help other owners. Mm -hmm. We are open with that communication channel, and we have amazing we have an amazing cap cap team now. The yeah. group coaching, yeah, um, leaders are great coaches. So I would say don't shy away from hiring a coach or you know working with a coach or at least following people that you aspire to be and and uh, try to get into the room with those people. Yeah, because you're not gonna do it alone. And yeah. and uh, you know speaking with them, interacting with them, following them on social media podcast is going to time collapse your journey and get you to a point where they are right now a little bit faster sooner. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, surround yourself with the right people, hire a coach and uh, it is intimidating, but plan for it to take longer and plan to spend a little bit more than what you originally thought. Yeah, that's a great reminder. Surround yourself with people that are doing things that have that you want to do or things that you can be inspired by and motivated yep. by. But then also like coaches need coaches. It doesn't matter how far you've come and how much you've learned. You're, there's still more to learn from someone 100%, else. 100%. Yeah. 100% agreed on that. Coaches need coaches. And uh, you, you, you are never not coachable. Mm -hmm. You're gonna, always going to be coachable for something new, business, life, wellness, right. could be anything. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to be open to that. And one, I feel one aspect will open doors to the others. I, I really feel fitness is the gateway drug for a lot of things. Um, it was for me, um, one thing that remained consistent was fitness. So, uh, I opened up on that area and became coachable, learned a lot over there. And that made me a better person, a better human and a better entrepreneur, yeah. I would say. <laughs> fitness is the catalyst. It is, it is, it is it, the most underrated one. And, uh, it, it is one of the best ones. It's free. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, right. I mean, people can do it in their home. So I would say start with that and then get a coaching program. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Vic, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Thank you. Where can our listeners learn more about you and your facility and all the amazing things that you're doing? Thank you. So it, it was great uh, chatting with you, Mary, Mary, on this podcast, and I've been following you. Um, so first of all, I, I know you stepped in from an owner into a different role, and that was a diff big transition yeah. for you. So I followed you through that journey, and uh, and now you're speaking on the stage, which yeah. is amazing. Uh, recently, you hosted the Growth Con, so again, great great journey of yours. Thank you. Uh, so it's it's an honor to be here, and uh, and I've seen great people like Todd Durkin and Bryce and all of those guys on this mm -hmm. seat. So. Uh, honor to share the same space with them, but thank you so much. Yeah. Um, regarding myself, uh, my team, we are in, located in Westboro. So Westboro Fit Body Bootcamp. Um, if you guys are in and around Massachusetts, hit us up. Look us up online, Westboro Fit Body Bootcamp, and uh, you know, call us, email us, and drop in for a workout. We promise we won't disappoint. <laughs> um, we'll give you a sweaty one. That's for sure. And uh, online on my personal brand, um, it's Vikit Fitness, V-I-K-D Fitness on Instagram and on Facebook. And Google up Vic Desai, Vesper of Fit Body Bootcamp. There's only one. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you to our listeners for joining us for another episode of the Beyond the Skill podcast. As always, make sure to check us out on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and share this episode with all of your friends. Until next time, thanks so much.